Thank you very, very much, Julie. And um, yeah, it's a real pleasure to be here. As Julie says, I'm Jim Robinson. I'm the co-coordinator of the Housing, Land and Property Area of Responsibility. And on behalf of the AOR, it's really great to, to welcome you today. Um, today is a real good chance to hear from colleagues who are you know, working on the ground in sort of four fascinating and challenging contexts. And it's a sort of a time to dig in. And as Julie mentioned, there's the question and answer uh, function on the on on the Zoom, but also a chance to share those questions. Uh, and uh, uh, so, just want to say from the off, there is no, you know, there are no stupid questions. Um, uh, as you listen, ask yourself, what what does this mean for my work? Um, what do you want to know more about? Like, why does it matter? So, really, just try and apply that, and feel free to uh, share those questions. And uh, uh, yeah, in in the Q and A, and and look forward to to discussing them further. So this session is hosted by the Housing, Land and Property Area of Responsibility, also known as the HLPAOR. Um, and we're part of the Global Protection Cluster led by NRC and UN Habitat. Um, and you know, we wanted to see who's here. We wanted to get a sense of your uh, background, how you're coming to this session. Um, and so we have a few questions uh, to ask you and would love to hear your or see your, your responses. So we have some poll questions, which I believe my colleagues will be able to share. So how do you feel about HLP? Now, I would probably take the top answer, which is that I'm you know, proud to be an HLP geek, but other people may have different perspectives and that's fine. Um, so there's a few options there. You know, do you even know, you know, is HLP, what even is it, right? You know, I mean, just three letters, high level panel, what is it? So we don't, you know, so yeah, it'd be good to see just the range of people who we have with us um, uh, today. So you have options, HLP geek, you might dream of HLP, you might see why it's important, you might have heard of it, you might not even know, but you're interested by maybe the countries that we're looking at today or, or just as part of the, the, wider, the wider forum. So um, now I don't know if um, how it works in terms of you seeing the results, does that, does that happen? As they come, are no, people seeing what so I see? Oh, okay. I'll, right. Yeah, I'll launch the poll when you say so, Jim. So if you want to give them another minute or two just to yes. answer all the questions, you can even go oh, through okay. all so the questions. Okay, so you can questions. go through the questions. Yep, they can go through Excellent. all three questions right now, and then we can launch the results and show the results to everyone. Fantastic. So there's the how do you feel about HLP? And then we're interested in what geographical region you're working in. Um, have a look on there and see, see what, what's relevant for you. And then if you do work on HLP, you know, what, what settings do you work on it? So today we're looking at customary settings as, as part of what we're discussing. And I'll talk a little bit about that in a moment. Um, but, you know, what does this, this mean to you? Does it mean anything? Um, so see how you answer that question as well. So, yeah, we'll wait another yeah, 20, 30 seconds to allow people to answer and then we'll share the findings. Um, there are some geeks amongst us. That's interesting. Um, okay, well, let's, let's, um, yeah, we'll give it 10 more seconds and then we'll, then we'll share. I could do a countdown, I suppose. I'll do a five, four, three, two, one. Okay, well, let's, um, let's share, share the results of those. So as we can see, there are some people dreaming of HLP and some um, self-proclaimed HLP geeks. Others see why it's important. Um, some have heard of it and some don't, don't even know about HLP. So that's great to have you with us as well. So hopefully you will learn something about that as we go along today. Geographically, there's quite a split in the work, but um, uh, you know, probably more focused on working in countries in Africa. But we see uh, people working across across the world uh, in different areas, as well as those not working on on an HLP at all. And again, a mix between some working in a kind of statutory system and some working in customary settings. And it might be that those terms mean something to you. It might be that they don't. Um, but we're yes, there that some people working there, some people in context where there are both and that's often the case. And then a number of you there who've answered that don't work on HLP specifically. So. Thank you for that. That gives us a sense of who's, uh, you know, in this the virtual room and uh, 
uh, the different experiences, which will hopefully lead to some very interesting, uh, you know, questions that you might have, and and you'll take different things from the presentation. So, I just want to spend a couple of minutes, really, just talking a little bit about um, HLP. What is housing, land, and property in a humanitarian response? What does that mean? And just a little bit about our focus of our session uh, today. Um, so, if if colleagues would be able to share. Um, is it is the is the first slide has it got the agenda on it or has it got um yes okay so so just to say these are the countries we're going to be discussing looking at we've got um colleagues from afghanistan south sudan uganda and on honduras um they're going to be speaking to us about their their work and then we're going to have time to, to discuss ask questions um and as uh, Julie was saying, the presenters can respond to those questions in the Q&A function as well. Um, so, so there'll be two ways that you will hear back. Um, okay, next slide, please. So just a quick word about the HLP AOR. So we support HLP coordination and response. So in the humanitarian responses, you know, there's I think 32 crises around the world where the protection cluster is active. And we have HLP coordination in around 21 of those. And we also support HLP work in other places as well. And we also have a role trying to advocate and sort of encourage others to consider HLP questions and to provide uh, uh, support on, on that as well. Um, so that's, that's, that's what the AOR is set up to do and, and to try and support you as you're working in these areas. Next slide, please. So what is HLP? Why does it matter? So. Housing, land and property essentially refers to the rules and arrangements that make it possible for people to live on their land and to, to use their property. And uh, HLP matters are at the heart of displacement. And so within humanitarian response, we often understand HLP rights are about having a home free from the fear of forced eviction, a place that offers shelter, safety and the ability to secure a livelihood. So. This isn't just about you know, where you stay, where you live, but it's also about how you live your life and what it means to be able to access the necessary resources for that, um, including you know, water and food and those kind of things. So um, we often see HLP issues coming up in that most emergency response where people need somewhere to stay. How can we make that safer for them, more secure? But then right the way through a sort of golden thread right the way through humanitarian response to solutions and thinking about development outcomes as well, where we see people uh, safe and secure. And, you know, you can't have a durable solution without HLP rights being being realised and secure as well. Um, so HLP has its origins in humanitarian in, in international human rights law and the right to adequate housing particularly, but it's not just about laws. Laws are important, but it also involves practices, customs, attitudes that revolve around the full spectrum of rights to public, private housing, land and property. And it's also not only about ownership, it's, it's about how people use land and property and housing. So it might be owners as we understand them, it might be tenants, cooperative dwellers, customary land tenure owners and users, people who live in kind of informal set settings and squatters who don't have any secure tenure at all. Now we talk a lot about tenure and, and how we might increase security of tenure. So I just wanna just touch on that briefly just right now. Um, so next slide, please. We have these two key HLP concepts, which you'll hear, hear mentioned, um, security of tenure, due diligence, and they're linked. If you go on to the next slide, please. So what is security of tenure or tenure security? What, what is it about? Well. It's about the relationship people have with the land or their housing. Um, and it is a system tenure is that governs, governs who can do what for how long on which housing, land and property. So it's about that relationship. And when we think of security of tenure, we're talking about like how secure do people feel in terms of the link uh, they have with that land, with that housing that they stay on. Um, because people have the right to uh, be protected against forced eviction, harassment, and other threats that might see them have to leave their, their housing or their land or their property. And we have to particularly focus on those that aren't um, that aren't, aren't often you know, thought of as much as they should be. So particularly, we work a lot on women's tenure uh, security in terms of HLP rights. And that's always an area we want to be asking how that's working for, for women and, and for other marginalised groups, maybe within a, within a setting. So much of our work is in customary settings and today we're going to explore what this means for HLP rights but what is customary settings what do we mean so 
when we're talking about customary settings and, 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 and a phrase like legal pluralism might get used. So we're talking about the coexistence of different land tenure systems. So different systems of rules to govern how people use and access land. Um, there might be different legal frame, frameworks. There might be customary and community approaches as well. So sometimes we see a split between statutory and customary uh, approaches to organizing land. In a context where there's conflict, uh, we might see competing authorities, so different groups claiming authority over land and having different systems in place. In other places, we might see a low level of kind of formal legal uh, system use. For example, land might not be registered. Um, in, in some places, uh, we see it's as low as 10% where the land is formally registered. So the understanding of who owns or has access to the land is based in community and custom, and there's different systems and sources of authority for land management. So we have to, when we're thinking about security of tenure, we have to be able to kind of adapt our approaches to take in these different legal systems, to be able to be asking good questions to try and understand the context and the nuance that's happening uh, in play. And due diligence was mentioned on the previous slide. And, and due diligence is in HLP is about asking those questions. Who can do what? Who has the right to use this land? Who needs to access this? And what's the impact going to be of our own interventions when we, when we get involved? And as the HLP AOR, we're focused on sort of supporting coordination. And I think coordination is a key part of this. We see, you know, the relationships and uh, have to be thought about who are the different actors, uh, what, what needs to be done to, to respond well to housing, land and property challenges. You know, it's not just about working with our own narrow sector, our own narrow focus. We have to think within the humanitarian context, we have to think about our shelter colleagues, about those that are working on site management. Uh, we have to think about food security. We have to think about education, which buildings are being used. When we think about mine action colleagues, for example, as they clear land, make it released and available again, what's the impact on people's ability to stay on that land? So there's all sorts of different ways we need to, to think about, about our land. Um, and just go to the next slide, please. Um, so this is just, a, again, a sort of a visual representation of some of the ideas around the legal pluralism. So, you know, we're at the same spot here. We see three people in this, in this image. One is saying they've bought a piece of land. They've got the formal contract. So they've used the statutory legal system to own that land. Someone else is saying this tree was planted by my grandfather. There's a connection there that has gone through the generations about, about their use of that land and, and maybe their, um, their, their right to, to continue using that. And then there's someone and they're bringing their animals through and saying the path is always, you know, this is the path we always take to the waterhole, that idea of a continued use of land and the right to access through that. So you've got three competing claims to the same piece of land. And there sometimes needs to be a careful negotiation as to about how those things work and the different sort of legal systems, the sources of authority that allow those to, uh, to work well and, and in peace. So today we're going to focus on um, HLP. And, and challenges in these four different contexts. So we're going to hear from colleagues working in Afghanistan, South Sudan, Uganda, and Honduras. And um, yeah, um, without further ado, I'm going to pass over to our first speaker, um, Ben Flower, who's the Senior Programme Specialist on Housing, Land and Property at UN Habitat in Afghanistan. And he's going to speak to us uh, about integrating HLP and climate programming. And as I'll say to all the, all the uh, speakers, we need to keep tight on our time. So I will be making sure you know when your, your time is up. Uh, <laughs> so Ben, over to you for your presentation. And we look forward to hearing it. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Jim. Um, OK, great. Thanks. So today I'll talk about HLP and climate programming. We're using a case study of Afghanistan's informal settlements. Uh, so next slide, please. So just a brief overview of the presentation. Uh, insecure HLP rights cause climate vulnerability in informal settlements by restricting investments in resilient housing and infrastructure. So this presentation assesses the potential for integrated HLP and climate programming to result in long-term resilience outcomes by strengthening HLP rights and upgrading community assets. I'll present the UN Habitat Programme, an yeah. informal settlement in Iraq, Afghanistan, where conflict and climate displaced people are exposed to floods, drought, and disease. I suggest uh, that a community centered integrated approach has a positive impact from both the HLP and a climate resilience standpoint. Uh, so, next slide, please. 
And so what are the links between HLP and climate vulnerability? Well, insecure HLP rights cause climate vulnerability because they restrict household and settlement level investments that reduce the impacts of climate shocks. So the relationship between HLP rights and investments is very simple. Authorities, service providers, community, HLP partners, uh, individuals, they can't invest in long-term investments uh, in assets that are infrastructure. So globally, informal settlements are important sites of HLP insecurity or tenure insecurity and also climate vulnerability. This is because of their physical attributes. They're located in hazard prone areas. They lack adequate housing and infrastructure. Uh, the characteristics of their inhabitants, they're often very vulnerable IDPs or, or low income migrants. And also their existence outside of formal governance systems. So with insecure tenure and also lacking basic or municipal services. So given the links between HLP and climate vulnerability, there's a growing consensus to support intervention that secure tenure and HLP rights, and by doing so, uh, lead to climate resilient outcomes. So next slide, please. So what approaches can strengthen HLP rights to climate? The first uh, involves strengthening individual or household HLP rights. The common intervention, the most widespread, is land title. Places customary tenure with legal land titles issued by the state. But despite some successes, areas with insecure HLP rights, such as enforced evidence, evidence are often excluded from title requirements for formal title. So then, a more recent approach, uh, rather than replacing, builds on these customary uh, tenure systems. Uh, these interventions include things like ICLA and also the fit for purpose model uh, that works on strengthening, recognizing and registering uh, customary tenure systems to increase their, their, their legal tenure security. And recent evidence from, from the Asia Pacific has shown that these approaches have resulted in increased climate resilient investments in some cases, uh, resulting in long-term uh, climate resilience outcomes. Uh, a second approach focused on community activities, including community planning, and implementing infrastructure investments, resilient infrastructure investments, which consolidates settlements, viewed as a key indicator of HLP security by residents. Uh, hi, Ben. Yep. Ben, hi, sorry. The, the um, audio is coming in and out a little bit. Um, so I wondered if either maybe you could turn off maybe the blurred background or or maybe your your video, just because we can't quite hear you as well. It's sort of coming in and out a little bit. Okay, I'll just I'll just stop the maybe I'll just stop the video. Yeah. Okay. Sure. Thanks, Ben. Is is that better? Yeah, that does sound better. Yeah. Thank you. Okay. Okay. So I'll just yeah. So I'll just start from yeah the second approach, which focuses on uh, these community level activities, including community planning uh, and the implementing of infrastructure investments. Uh, and as I mentioned, these can directly, as well as uh, increase the de facto tenure security of areas by gaining uh, legitimacy uh, of the authorities in the HLP rights association. It also directly reduces climate vulnerability uh, by installing or upgrading uh, crucial climate resources. So also strengthening community-based organization is a, is a community approach that can be harnessed uh, for HLP and climate resilience outcomes. For example, supporting grassroots organizations to negotiate with authorities uh, for HLP rights has been an approach that's been widely promoted to secure tenure um, by organizations uh, such as UN Habitat and others. Um, uh, there are also uh, numerous examples as well of, of community-based organizations being very important in, in increasing climate resilience uh, of, of disaster or climate uh, exposed and vulnerable communities. So is this community-based approach that I'll highlight um, in relation to Afghanistan? Uh, so the next slide, please. So integrating HLP and climate programming in Afghanistan. So Afghanistan provides a, a case study to assess integrated HLP and climate interventions. Uh, the country is ranked sixth in the most uh, recent climate risk index uh, because the population is highly vulnerable, uh, exposed to droughts, floods, landslides, and also extreme heats. Uh, 
These risks are occurring in one of the, the gravest humanitarian emergencies globally. Uh, and within that, the residents of more than a thousand urban informal settlements are acutely vulnerable. They're located in hazard prone areas, populated largely by IDPs. They lack basic services, uh, adequate housing, and they're subject to not just threats, but frequent evictions by authorities. UN Habitat HLP activities have aimed to increase tenure security in these areas. Uh, and this case study will focus on a pilot project that does so by integrating community uh, HLP and climate resilience programmatic tools. The case study settlement is an informal settlement in the city of Peru, Afghanistan's second largest city uh, and the capital of the drought prone uh, Western province and the community uh, consists around 400 households um, and, and around 2,000 people. Uh, next uh, slide, please. So how do we assess the HLP and climate needs in the community? Well, the first step uh, was to uh, implement a full coverage household survey and participatory assessment, which included participatory hazard mapping, um, seasonal calendars and other tools. Uh, we found that residents were exposed to severe climate hazards associated with their location in the drought prone western region and on the banks of a large river uh, which ran dry in the summer and is prone to flash flooding in spring and winter. So drought and flood were identified as the most severest, but also uh, they're associated with disease, for example, lack of uh, clean water during periods of drought uh, and contamination of flood water with, with, with wastewater. Um, in, in periods of, of flooding. Um, so we found that HLP insecurity or tenure insecurity is, near, is an issue that underpins this vulnerability. The, the residents had occupied uh, state land and they had no legal property documents. And this, uh, this insecure tenure or insecure HLP uh, situation limited housing investment. Uh, it resulted in low quality dwellings with inadequate sanitation uh, that were prone to damage in periods of flood and uh, and uh, wash facilities that were e easily um, contaminated uh, during uh, floods um, leading to disease and other things. Uh, there was also the absence of, of crucial climate resilient settlement infrastructure, which is again related to uh, the insecure tenure and the, 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 their status as occupying state land. There's a lack of a water supply network and there was flood drainage, uh, absence of a flood drainage system. And this caused um, uh, big problems during, during, during periods of climate shock, including the loss of property, the spread of disease, uh, and in some cases, even uh, death. Uh, so the, the precarious uh, livelihood characteristics also compounded these challenges. And, and again, female-headed households uh, suffered the lowest income and, and, and were assessed to be the most vulnerable. The community capacity to respond was very limited uh, due to their extreme precarity. Uh, However, they noted the important role of the community-based organization in the settlement in supporting residents and, and, and providing assistance to those most in need. Um, so the next slide, please. So actually, and, the eight, yeah. And just, just so you know, just a few more minutes, okay? So, um, yes. Okay, this, yeah. Nearly done. Thanks. Great. <laughs> <on the slide. laughs> okay. uh, so yeah, so the HLP response, um, uh, the, uh, the UN Habitat deployed an integrated HLP and climate uh, response to address the vulnerabilities identified in the assessment. The aim was one, to strengthen the community HLP rights, and two, to plan and implement the climate resilient community infrastructure. Uh, to this end, we did participatory land use mapping, uh, which was conducted to create a spatial record of the settlement, including approximate parcel boundaries. Uh, community based organizations endorsed the maps. And these are in turn endorsed by uh, local authorities. Uh, doing so, this provided protection to the customary tenure arrangements that existed in the settlement. And in the longer term, this can pave the way for ICLA or fit for purpose household level uh, land registration. Uh, in addition, community based solutions and strategies mapping um, identified critical climate investments, uh, drainage and wastewater. Community groups were supported to secure authorities' endorsement of these maps. And this way, the HLP rights and climate and of the settlement obtained official uh, recognition, reducing the risk of eviction. Uh, finally, priority uh, uh, resilient community, uh, the priority uh, climate resilient community uh, investments that are identified were actioned. Uh, they were implemented to reduce climate risk and consolidate the settlement to strengthen their de facto uh, HLP rights. And a flood drainage system was installed, which was uh, constructed using cash for work 
uh, with community labour. And on the next slide here, um, I, won't go, I won't go through this um, uh, beneficiary uh, comment and experience of the programme, um, but um, you can see they had many benefits, both in terms of the HLP and climate resilience standpoint. Um, and then the final slide. Um, so yeah, the, the project identified numerous HLP and climate tools that can be used for uh, mutually strengthening HLP and climate resilience outcomes. I've just detailed them here. Uh, I don't have time to go through them, but should you wish to uh, deploy them in your own programs, please uh, peruse at your leisure. And we're also publishing a paper and toolkit based on this experience um, of this pilot, which we will share in the coming weeks. Uh, thanks very much. Uh, Thanks, Ben. Thank you so much for that. And um, yeah, just to, I suppose, make the point that, um, you know, the presentations, we're going to gather them together afterwards and make them available. Um, the session's being recorded as well. So we will make that available on the uh, uh, Global Protection Cluster website and through newsletters and, and that kind of thing as well. So and there'll be a, set, a way to, to catch up and find out more about the work. Um, and please do have a think if there's questions there that came up for you you'd like to hear more about, then um, let us know, put that in the, the Q&A. We're already seeing a few questions coming in um, about various things. So uh, thank you for that, Ben. Thanks. And we're going to turn now to uh, South Sudan and uh, I'm pleased to introduce uh, Margaret uh, Wazuk, who is the um, NRC's Information Counselling and Legal Assistance Coordinator and also coordinator of the uh, HLP AOR in South Sudan. So Margaret, over to you. Jim, we lost Maggie on her mobile phone. Okay. Well, so, okay. Not sure Let's what see. just now. <laughs> okay, that's okay. Thanks, thanks for letting me know. Um, so do we have Evelyn and Jordana, are they uh, here and, and ready to present? Because we can move to Uganda, um, come back to South Sudan uh, a little bit later. Evelyn, are you okay to present? Yes, Jim, thank you. Excellent. We can go ahead and present. Great, so we have Evelyn Ajambo, who's the Programme Management Assistant on Land Management with UN Habitat in Uganda, joined by Ms. Jordana Wamboga, who's the Project Officer with UCOBAC. I'm not sure what that stands for, but maybe you can say as you start. But yes, over to you. And um, yes, we've got 15 minutes and I'll, I'll let you know when there's a few minutes left. Okay, thank you. Okay, yeah, thank you once again, Jim. As Jim said, um, Evelyn Ajambo, I'll be presenting with my colleague, Jordana Wamboga. She works with the Uganda Community Based Association for Women and Children's Welfare. Our presentation is on unlocking the climate change puzzle, integrating land registration and wetland use, wetland wise use planning as essential solutions. Uh, and we shall be tailoring it to one of our projects in, uh, in Uganda. And next, please. Next slide. Yeah, just to give us a little statistics about Uganda, for those who may not know, Uganda is located in East Africa. And uh, currently we have a population of approximately 48 million and uh, a population growth rate of 3% per annum. Approximately 73.6 of the livelihood of the population lives in rural areas and 26.4 uh, 26 of, 26 of the population is the one that is in the urban areas. Uganda is one of the countries that has the world's youngest population with over 78% of the population below the age of 30 years, you can imagine. The, the community heavily relies on agriculture and this is mainly subsistence, which accounts for around 22.5% of the Uganda's gross domestic project. Thank you, GDP. Next slide, please. Um, in addition to that, Uganda's land is majorly customary with over 80% of the land being under customary land tenure. And uh, this is mainly unregistered without any formal documentation. We have limited access to land information. There is a lot of systematic inequalities and uh, a lot of women's limited access and control over land. 
you find that less than 3% of the registered land is owned by, by women in Uganda. Uh, we have a high number of land evictions and disputes, and we also have a challenge of implementation of the legal and regulatory reforms that have been, we have the regulatory reforms that are very slow. The, the reforms are slow and the ones that are existing implementation is, is very slow as well. And next slide, please. Yeah, just to give us um, a small background about the customer tenure, but maybe before I mention this, in Uganda, we basically have four tenure systems. One is called the freehold, the leasehold, Milo, and then the customary. As I said earlier, this accounts for over 80% of Uganda's land. And the law has gone ahead to provide provisions for customary land recognition, and it also ensures that uh, customary land can be registered and the, the holders can be issued with formal documents called the Certificates of Customary Ownership. Some of these laws include the Land Act, the, uh, the National Land Policy, the, the, the Land Regulations, and uh, of course the Constitution of Uganda of 1995. The customary law is the customary land is subject to the customary law of an area. So in other words, Uganda, we have very many different cultures. Each, 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 each culture has its own norms and practices. So this, this land, it, uh, it is subject to the norms and practices of a specific area in, in the country. Then uh, despite having the necessary policy and legal frameworks to improve our customary land tenure, very little progress has been done in form of documentation and uh, implementation of those policies and legal frameworks. Next slide, please. So as GLTN and uh, UN Habitat, we come in to respond through one of our projects. We, we've implemented several projects on the customary land tenure, but uh, for this specific this specific session we wanted to narrow down to one of the projects that is currently ongoing. It is called Land at Scale. It is a bigger project. It's uh, funded by RVO from the Netherlands. And uh, Uganda is one of the countries in which this project is ongoing. So the main objective and goal of this project was to build, was to, to build on the different on the previous experiences and lessons of the past projects that we've implemented, we wanted to contribute to the development of a structured and scalable approach towards improved tenure security and sustainable land use for men, women, youth on customary land in a participatory way. And th this could be attained through the specific objectives, which are mainly three. And the first one is the improved tenure security for men, women, and youth inclusive, climate smart, and sustainable land use planning, then improved capacity and awareness of key land actors on customary land registration and land use planning. Next slide, please. So the project is basically in Uganda, we are implementing it in four sites, as you can see on the map, in West Nile region of Uganda, in the mountain Elgon, Choga Plains, and Southwestern Uganda. However, the project was, um, it is phased. We use a phased approach. We wanted to have two phases, the 1.5 years, one and a half years for the consolidation. We tried to see what would work best. And in the consolidation phase, we implemented initially in two areas, Southwestern and Choga Plains. Currently, we are in the scaling out phase and we shall be adding two regions of West Nile, Mount Elgon, and then work will continue in the previous two. So work is currently ongoing in all the four. Next slide, please. Uh, just to give us a little highlight on uh, some of the key achievements we've got from the project of Land at Scale. We have systematic mapping, adjudication, and registration of customary land rights in Kavale, that is southwestern Uganda, and Butaleja, which is the Choga Plains. Over 13,677 persons have been mapped, representing 14,675 beneficiaries. And of these, we find that uh, 8,000 
8,079 are male and 6,596 are female, which is a very great percentage on women inclusion. And then we also have the youth. Then over 4,000 certificates of customary ownership. As I mentioned earlier, these are legal documents that are provided for by law that are issued to landowners of customary land. And uh, over 8,000 are pending issuance. Uh, we also apply the alternative dispute resolution mechanism. This has tended to be, it has turned out to be a very effective tool in, uh, in resolving disputes that occur during, before, during, and after mapping, especially these are boundary, boundary disputes, inheritance these disputes, some are within families, between families, others are even between sub counties and districts. So we use the alternative dispute resolution tool. And over nine, oh, 92 of the out of the 118 disputes have been resolved using this tool, which is over 60%. And next, please. Uh, and the other aspect of the project is improved capacity and awareness. We ensure that during the project, we train the institutions that are responsible to provide the services of land registration, right from the district level to the sub-county level. All the land administrators, we train them on the processes of customary land registration. We train them on the different GLTN land tools and approaches. Uh, we also give them chance to create tools that they think can, can be, can be appropriate in registering land tools for the local people and then we customize them to fit into the project. We train people on field data collection, on sustainable wetland management and also on the applying the alternative dispute resolution mechanisms in a dispute resolution. Uh, next please. So under climate smart and uh, inclusive land use planning, the project has two components. I will speak about one, then my colleague will come in. My colleague Jordana will finalize with the other component, zeroing down to one of the areas, which is uh, Butaleja. So for this, we encourage land use planning. And basically what, you do, what we do for this, uh, we apply the tenure responsive land use plan tool. It is a tool developed by Global Land Tool Network. Uh, where we ensure that as, as, as mapping is happening, as registration of customer land rights is, is ongoing, planning is happening. For example, we designate the protected areas, the wetlands, the game reserves, so that as we are mapping the rights of the people, because sometimes the locals don't know to what extent they can go. So we show them that this is the buffer zone. So as we map, we can't go beyond that. Maybe we can show them how to sustainably use the extra area, but we can't have it documented for their own, for, for them, because those are usually public areas. Then uh, with that, we work with the communities in a participatory way to ensure that we develop the physical development plans. We engage the community right from the start. They envision what, what they would want to see in their community well, for example, in five years to come, in 10 years to come, for example, the plan that you developed in, in Southwestern, it is a, for one sub-county, it is a 10-year plan. So what vision do they want to see? Then we help them to put it together. We help them to improve it, work with the experts, the planners, and we engage all the stakeholders right from the government to the local person. If you could see the pictures here, here we had um, gone to one of the sub-counties, called the people that had given us their views. Maybe they want to stay at school here. They want to manage this in the way they would want. So we're showing them what we had brought up and then get their views, get their comments. If they have any alternatives, we, we undertake them and then bring back the revised plan. So for this, we've been able to have a plan approved by the government through the government systems and uh, it was developed and approved. And the government went ahead to, through our support, to undergo a capacity development workshop on how this plan can be implemented by the different land actors. Allow me to stop here and I'll invite Jordana. Jordana, could you kindly take us through the next session? Thank you.
Okay. Okay. Uh, so I want to take you through through the second uh, presentation uh, on uh, wetland wetland management planning. Uh, this, this initiative was rolled out in Butaleja district, uh, basically because Butaleja is 40% are wetland and 60% are dry land. Uh, in this area, um, we realized that there is that the area is predominantly uh, uh, predominantly uh, an area of, uh, of customary land, and uh, that is the biggest uh, part of, of uh, the land that is held in that area. So, in the, in in part of the the, the, the activities that we implemented, uh, documentation of land rights. Um, basically, this was so because uh, we realized uh, through a research that was conducted by one of the professors at Macquarie University that uh, most of the land uh, agreements um, were just uh, normal, normal written land agreements without uh, formal documentation of land rights. Uh, Butaleja, yeah, Butaleja livelihoods of, of communities evolve around with land resource exploitation, like I've mentioned, 40% of, of their land is a, is, is a wetland and a place has a very high population. So uh, the communities have been forced to utilize the wetlands, mainly where they are doing uh, rice farming, uh, grazing, and then also fishing as one of the alternatives that uh, the communities have uh, decided to Then um, the other thing is uh, women hold secondary rights through relationships with men, uh, mostly people not own land. Can you hear me? I, um, on my screen, I feel like everybody has frozen. Uh, it's it's cutting in and Can out I continue, today. Jim? Can, can, okay. Is that better? Yeah, we, we hear you. It just sometimes goes a little, but yeah. Keep going, Jordana. Okay. 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 So basically, women hold secondary rights because land ownership is uh, is majorly uh, a preserve of men, and uh, therefore the women can only uh, utilize the land through uh, access access and use rights, uh, and that's how they are able to to till and uh, and farm in the lands. But uh, most times you realize that much as they do the most uh, the heavy lifting of the work the men uh, show up during the harvesting period and therefore uh, they negotiate uh, they, they take on the negotiation in the markets and take all the money next slide next slide please and Jordana, just uh, another two minutes so if you could just sort of bring it to uh, yeah. close yes. shortly that'd be great thank you Jordana Sorry, I didn't get that. Uh, just another two minutes, and then uh, we'll need to move to the next uh, speaker. So if you could just yeah, bring it to okay. the conclusions, that would be great. Thank you. Yes, but the person controlling the, the presentation is not moving the slide. Okay, anyway, uh, this, this initiative is uh, regulated by a legal framework, uh, one of them being the National Envi Environmental Act and the Ramsar Convention on Wetlands. Uh, where develop, uh, development and adaptation, and adaptation of wetland wise use uh, guidelines and regulations are one of the reference points. And then the other legal framework is the uh, Ministry of Water and Environment and, 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 uh, and also the wetland resource use permits uh, as, uh, as one of the, 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 the documents that uh, these people are able to use. Uh, why, why did we do this uh, initiative? Uh, like I've mentioned already, uh, people are many and therefore they had no alternative but to move into the wetlands. And uh, through this, uh, they've been experiencing floods, drying of wetlands, loss of biodiversity due to severe degradation. And also they, because the people are really many on the resource, uh, therefore they encounter conflicts in the wetland. So through GLTN, uh, there was an approach that uh, is uh, that was that has been rolled out by, by the Ministry of Water and Environment. And this is uh, this, we rolled out a wetland community management planning, which has eight steps that people use. 
um, and then they are able to use the, the wetland in a wise use manner. I'm sorry, I'm not going to go through the nitty gritties because uh, we are short on time. But what are the, uh, the benefits of this uh, uh, community-based approach? Uh, basically, it enhances local knowledge of the wetland ecosystems, uh, being that it, it, is, it, it, is, it involves the, the community who come up and propose some of these, uh, these interventions. It poses a sense of ownership and stewardship towards the wetlands, and it also pro uh, promotes community engagement and participation in land registration and uh, wetland management processes. It also strengthens local institutions and organizations involved in the land and wetland management, but also above everything else, it raises awareness among the, uh, among the wetland communities on the value and the importance of wetlands. Um, and uh, this has been uh, a good, uh, this has been a good, a good, a good intervention because it involves them in the decision making processes where they propose some of these, uh, the, some of the solutions, and therefore it is owned by the community. Um, what are the results and the impacts um, through this initiative through GLTN? We have so far been able to develop to develop four community. Uh, wetland management plans in 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 four of the of the of the resource areas, but also there has been sustainable resource use, community empowerment, enhanced collaboration and partnerships, and also we have uh, registered a decrease in conflicts, improved access and use rights on the wetland resource. What are the ch challenges? Uh, there is all, of course there is always um, political in, in, uh, interference from the leaders in the community. Because um, oftentimes we realize that uh, some of these leaders uh, really do not know some of these interventions, but uh, because they are looking for political buying, they tend to miss the communities, but also there has been unpredictable weather conditions and uh, discriminatory cultural beliefs because of the patriarchy uh, that has been uh, taking place. What are the lessons learned? Uh, we learned that the collaborations with government institutions and the, and the district district uh, natural resource departments um, are an effective approach in ensuring that we realize some of these benefits, but also establishment of community wetland management planning committees and management committees play an important role during community-led approaches. Um, involving involvement of the local political leadership is vital because you need the political buy-in for you to be able to realize any intervention or approach in a particular area. Uh, but also we realize that there is need for continuous awareness raising uh, such that uh, the mindsets are changed because people need to unlearn things that they have uh, grown up now, uh, doing over time. So it takes a bit of time for you to do the, the, to the mindsets of the community. Uh, we also learned that uh, through the, the organizing of learning exchanges for the wetland users is an important tool uh, because people normally learn from seeing, and so that is a, a, a good approach. Um, uh, lastly, recommendations. Uh, we recommend uh, gov that, that, that there is need for government to integrate some of these initiatives to, make, to maintain the momentum but there is also need for mindset change, uh, continuous uh, sensitization, like I have mentioned, uh, building of local leaders' capacity on gender issues, most especially because leaders are, are voted into these offices. Uh, so there is need for you to, to keep doing this so that you don't lose track. Then adopting a holistic management uh, a holistic management for alternative livelihoods to ease pressure on the wetlands and then also lobbying government to establish rice schemes like the one that is in this area called the Doho Irrigation Scheme where farmers are really supported with various incentives to be able to, to grow their rice. And lastly, knowledge are vital. Okay, uh, thanks, Jordana. Thank you so much for for presenting, and thank you for uh, really your 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 persistence when the the tech sometimes lets us down. So I really appreciate that. Thank you, Jordana. Thank you, Evelyn. And I think with both those presentations, Afghanistan and Uganda, you can really see 
some of the links between the HLP challenges that we see and face in that initial humanitarian displacement moment and how they link to the longer term efforts uh, to find sort of solutions and uh, longer term ways in which people can have secure housing and access to land. Um, so, yeah, thank you uh, both. And we're now going to move to Honduras. And uh, yeah, really pleased to introduce Johanna uh, Miranda, who's the Associate Legal Officer with UNHCR Honduras. Um, Johanna's going to speak to us uh, in Spanish. So if you would like to use the interpretation, please do click on the three dots at the bottom and find the interpretation bit and choose whichever language you would like to, to hear. Um, Johanna, um, over to you. Thank you, team and morning colleagues. So we are going to present in Spanish and as well, all the details of the presentation you will find on that sheet that we will share through the chat. And that's it. So we can start and I'm going to switch to Spanish. Um, can you tell me the interpretation? It's already, it's ready for the other colleagues. I think so. Are the interpreters ready? I believe they are. Interpreter okay. ready. Excellent. Please Great. carry on, Johanna. Good morning, everyone. I will briefly speak to you in this section about two elements, but it's important for you to understand the context of violence and displacement, forced displacement in Honduras. So housing and land protection as a strategy for, compl for conflict prevention and the promotion of solutions to forced displacement in Honduras. Briefly, I would like to mention, next slide, please. Great, thanks. So in our context is characterized for widespread violence and there are huge rates of uh, homicide rates and also every 20 hours a woman is murdered. This is a context that results from violence and organized crime and drug trafficking, criminal gangs that are part of the population. The displacement exists in urban and rural areas and this violent context means that Honduras is the eighth country in the world with the largest number of new asylum seekers. And at least 2.7% of population has been displaced. These are over 58,000 households. And just to show a little of the context, in 2022 and 2023, many environmental, 23 and environmental and territorial defenders have been killed since last year. This means Honduras is one of the most dangerous countries in the defense of land and territory. And in May this year, the World Bank concluded the likelihood of increased land conflicts due to tenure insecurity and loss of agricultural land productivity. From all the information we have gathered, we're able to see that only 32% of population managed to keep their house after being displaced. Next slide. As I was mentioning before, the main drivers for forced displacement in Honduras are extortion, forced recruitment, dispossession of homes, land and property, gender-based violence, social and territorial control, human rights violations, and political violence. But we will focus on dispossession of homes, land and property. And the Inter-American Commission of human rights in uh, concluded that there is a long-standing social, environmental, and agrarian conflict in the country related to land and territories, which have led to high levels of violence. Next slide, please. 
So the dispossession of homes, land and property is one of the causes for displacement because the organized, the criminal groups exercise territorial control for economic purposes. They dispossess the, the houses, they mark invisible borders so people cannot cross over from one area to the next. It's also a way for extortion collection and it is used for drug trafficking and exploitation of natural resources in rural areas. So the dispossession of land and homes is the result of threats, killings, harassment, territorial disputes, etc. There's also the development of mega projects for tourism, and these and other issues have led to the situation that we have identified that those most at risk are women, peasants, young people, and the defenders of land and territory. Next slide, please. So we want to share with you the context, the institutional context, because there are many different registration systems in the country. We have the institution, uh, the, the register, the municipalities, and the national institution. What is the current situation? Less than 29.3% of uh, the register is clearly made in Honduras and less than 27% of land is registered. This is critical because we're talking about a country and this course makes people even more vulnerable in violent situations and in violent contexts. These are people who are in risk of being displaced and all of this leads to a lack of uh, land tenure or a multiplicity of uh, property titles over the same lot of land. Next slide, please. Now, specifically, what does this mean for uh, displaced communities? There's unclear tenure for communities, that are, there's a destruction occupation of home by gangs, unresolved agrarian or land conflicts, loss of property at the place of origin, lack of uh, clear mechanisms, and there are no uh, restitution or compensation mechanisms. There's a violence sensitive information system and effect on tenure, and we must exercise pedagogy on tenure rights as well. Next slide, please. Okay. Now, understanding all the context, the crime, or the organized crime context, and the limitations of the government to organize a territory and regulate tenure, we would like to share with you the strategy that we've implemented to help the state provide responses to protect houses and land in context of violence, so as to provide responses to people in risk of displacement. Next slide, please. And here's where we want to focus. This is the how, how we are developing the strategy and how it was uh, designed. It contains five uh, elements that are concurring. That means that they are all developed in parallel. Firstly, evidence collection on this situation of dispossession or abandonment. And to that end, we developed a cooperation mechanism with other entities, state institutions. We also make a report on the house, on the land in Honduras, critical elements from the point of view of the regulatory framework or institutional and existing uh, elements. We also uh, establish a report that uh, produce a report that talks about the relationship between dispossession and displacement. We use this to produce reports on forced uh, displacement to identify the risks, the causes, and territorial concentration. And this year, we incorporated a new variable 
of uh, displacement to measure the dimension of it, the causes for displacement, and another element on tenure security. That uh, this is a survey that is conducted every year by the National Statistics Institute with the support of the World Bank. With that, we have a clear situation of uh, the people in displacement to generate data and promote public policies that respond to these problems. The second element, we talk about institutional strengthening. This is state institutions, but also for control organization. We've mainly worked with the institution of properties that is uh, responsible for regulating properties and registration in Honduras with technological tools such as cores, drones. These are tools that allow geo referencing, topography, and they reduce the time needed for identifying assets in the territory. And this has also helped us to conduct real references in high risk areas or to do so in areas that wouldn't be uh, reachable otherwise. This provides a possibility of making satellite images of how the area is and make a more accurate um, assessment of the of the land. To that end, we uh, work Johanna, with the Secretary of Human Rights. Johanna, that works. Just, just uh, two more minutes, please, if you're able to. Thanks. Two more minutes. And two. the third element is the identification of affections through community leadership, individual cases of displaced people. Here we have a repository of abandoned plates. Uh, and in the area of regulatory and institutional alignment, we managed to pass the forced displacement law and thus protect protect the territory. We are currently in this uh, aspect, but there's already scaffolding and we have a created institution that is capable of advancing in the assessment of abandoned goods within this context of violence and displacement. Next slide, please. So the strategy, is a link to the state, to the communities, and to all the organizations that we work with. We have worked with the international institutions, and due to a structural problem that has to do with the protection of rights, we have required the participation of other development aid um, actors that are necessary to improve the solutions in registration. This is part of the conflict prevention policy, but also is part of our strategy for durable solutions. Next slide. Okay. And as future actions, next. Uh, the, the, the law that was pre recently passed includes two main elements that is a material protection and legal protection one has to do with the assets that are left in these houses that are or in these places that are abandoned and that are occupied by third parties and how do we materialize this in the daily life of, of people next slide The actions that may be implemented based on the law that ha have been uh, that are being currently deployed is that there are prohibition of transactions on the abandoned property exception from payment of real estate tax until the property can be taken possession of that the institution providing public services suspend services and do not charge for them the extension of credits for interest interest free payments and access to free legal advice and assistance. All of these are actions that are yet to be developed, but this work has already started and 
we already have tools that of a legal and administrative nature that in this context have been uh, abandoned or occupied due to the violent situation in the country. That is information, the budget that we are going to share through the chat. Um, um, also, we are going to share and uh, it's a brief document about the, 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 the practice of registration in Honduras. If you want to uh, more information, we are open and we are ready for your queries. Thank you very much. Thank you, Johanna. Thanks for that. And uh, thanks also for joining us so early in the morning as well, where you are. So appreciate that. And just to say in the chat, you can see some uh, resources that have been shared. And also, please do keep asking your questions um, in the question and answer session and section, and we will come to those shortly. Uh, really pleased to introduce uh, Margaret Wazulogor, who's the NRC Information Counseling and Legal Assistance uh, Coordinator in South Sudan and also co-coordinator of the HLP AOR South Sudan. Uh, Margaret, I believe you are back with us, uh, so please um, go ahead. Thank you. Thank you, Jim, for the opportunity and uh, thank you, everyone. Uh, apologies for the past uh, technical hitch, but uh, I think right now we are right on course. So I'd like to introduce, um, H, uh, as Jim has rightly said, I'm the HLPAOR coordinator. And in South Sudan, we have a triage uh, leadership where we have IOM and HDC who are co-coordinators in this HLPAOR um, implementation in South Sudan. Next slide. So just to give you a brief um, history of our context, South Sudan is well, has been known for the conflict, the long-term conflict. And with conflict, we know that there are a lot of HLP issues that come in place. So in South Sudan, we have the dual nature kind of uh, HLP protection, where we have the customary kind of uh, legal system and the statutory legal system, where customary is mostly held by traditional leaders, the community leaders who are able to govern or carry out leadership in terms of HLP. And we also have the statutory, which is under the laws, uh, like the transitional constitution of the Republic, the Land Act and the Local Government Act. So these are some of the laws that govern HLP implementation in South Sudan. So in South Sudan, the classification of lands are three. We have uh, public land, we have private land, and we have community land. So public land is more is, is governed or it's pub, it's by owned by the government. Then we have private land that is individually owned and community land that is held by the community and I, is used as a unit by the community. So in South Sudan, the rules for access and usage of this land is unwritten. So most of it, you'll find the customary land, it is administered and interpreted, um, but it is enforced by formal systems, which is the formal uh, institutions. So largely the customary rules and uh, land usage and access vary from one community to another. However, you find that these institutions and their mandates are recognized under the Local Governments Act. So you'll, you'll find in the Local Governments Act of South Sudan, uh, community leadership in, in terms of land is recognized and they're given their mandate to carry out decisions in terms of community uh, reflected um, lands in South Sudan. So traditional authorities normally allocate land for residential, agricultural, forestry and grazing purposes, but subject to consultation with the community. So you'll find as much as the traditional authorities have that mandate, they have to ensure that their community gives them a go ahead in terms of any practices or any usage of that land. So as you'll see uh, in the presentation, you'll find the, 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 the kind of hierarchy. We have the chiefs at the bottom and the chiefs are the ones who go into the bombers. In bombers is like villages. Then we have the Payam Land Council, which goes um, it's a step higher from the village where they go and be able to find out or make decisions in terms of the payment. 
Now, on top of that is the county land authority. This one is in each county. This uh, office is there to help in HLP issues. Next slide, please. So this, uh, in terms of the duality uh, of the institutions of uh, HLP in South Sudan, we mentioned or earlier on just a few minutes back, I mentioned we have the statutory and we have the, the customary. So for the legal systems that are there, we, the topmost is the Ministry of Lands, Housing and Urban Development. This is on the national level. Then it comes down to the state where we have the State Ministry of Housing, Land and Public Utilities. This works or it um, regulates in terms of the 10 different states in South Sudan. Then also we have the South Sudan Land Commission. This one, it guides and uh, gives advice to the two institutions on, on matters to do with land laws. Then we also have for the state, uh, state land commission, which is also a sub office of the National Land Commission and the judiciary. So all these are the formal sort of uh, offices or setups that are there in terms of HLP institutions. Then in terms of the customary, we have uh, the customary, uh, the county land authority uh, that is in the county level. We have the Payam Land Council, which is in the Payam level. This is lower than, than the county. We have customary law courts. These ones are, held, um, are presided over by the traditional leaders, which here in South Sudan we call the A courts and the B courts. And then we have the chiefs who are now deeply rooted in the villages and try to get or to solve issues to do with housing, land and property down in the grassroots. Next slide, next slide please. Just to mention, both systems are, are recognized by the law. So both of them are recognized and they have the mandate to handle land issues in South Sudan. So next is we have the access to HLP. Who, how do we access HLP in South Sudan? Number one is uh, the right to land in the communities derived uh, by community going through the common ancestry. If you are born in that community, automatically you have a right to inherit land. Then uh, secondly is gifting. The community can decide to gift a person if the person is willing to come and bring development. In that area, the community can gift and they can allow um, someone who's not from that community to be incorporated or integrated in the community. We also have donations. And a good example is with the number of internally displaced persons in South Sudan, we find that the government negotiates with community leaders so that they can be able to give land where IDPs can be able to settle. And once they settle, they are given a duration. After that duration, they're expected either to return to their places of origin or to move forward to other areas. Then lastly is transaction arrangements, where you find the community has the right to allow people to purchase or to transfer the land from one person to another. Next slide, please. So um, the customary systems and HLP in South Sudan. So mostly, most of these customary ways, it's either orally, it is unwritten and is subject to interpretation by elders, which makes protection bias. So you find majority of these customary systems, there are no written laws that are down, but each tribe or each community has a different way of handling their HLP issues. Then uh, the custodians of the customs are mostly sole proprietors. You find maybe the leader of a community is the one who is able to run or has power over the community. And often they use the discretion of their power to allocate land as offered to some protection based as in, including tribal or clan affiliations. Then also we have gender. In South Sudan, gender is very sensitive because you find we, we here in South Sudan, women, according to the customs and traditions, have no right to own land, but the laws are saying, especially in the transitional constitution, is clearly mapping out that women have a right to, to access and to own land. So this gender, this gender disparity or 
the, the kind of different aspects to it have made it quite difficult for women to maybe access land of their own because they mentioned you have to either inherit it and if you are married, you should you are not considered to, to be able to own land because you are someone else's property. But more progress has been um, registered in areas where HLP actors have injected capacity investments in that we hold a lot of HLP trainings and dispute resolution trainings. However, the gender bias still exists in some locations, and this uh, limits full enjoyment of these rights by women. Then also there is the increased access to justice, where here we find a lot of formal justice uh, structures have been destroyed, and under resources, the, the, the resources are not enough. Informal justice systems, inaccessibility to displacement, you know, it has made it very difficult in terms of conflict resolution and uh, the disputes is faster and cheaper and easier to find. So this access to justice is what we are pushing on as HLPAOR in South Sudan so that we can be able to solve most of these problems. Then also there is, a, we try to promote a local ownership. Hence, there's more acceptance of decisions by communities and also provide opportunities for HLP actors to influence the customary practices. This, this is by going deep into the different uh, communities to give all this necessary awareness about what housing, land, and property rights are and what their rights are in, when it comes to land. Next slide. So uh, another thing that also we do is we promote, uh, we ask people in terms of promotion of access to land by displaced communities. This is through negotiations. We do a lot of advocacy with the government and the communities. In some areas, however, you'll find that as much as there's this uh, access to land, the, the displacement of communities has led to secondary occupation where no proper due diligence has been conducted. A good example, let me use this Juba, you'll find that we have a lot of two major IDP camps here. Once they came into Juba, the government just had um, negotiations with the community and the community offered land. But now when it is the time for them to go back to their original places, they are refusing and they are actually going ahead to secondarily occupy other people or other host communities' land. So there's also the preserved land for absentees. In, customary, in the customary system, even if you go as a refugee, you leave the, the area for 10, 15, 20 years, the community still knows that this land is for this particular family. So they always try to guard it and expecting that either the owner, the original owner or their children and come and take over that place. Um, another point is also operating um, as a protection in rural areas from land grabbing. Mostly you'll find in these customary systems, especially in rural areas, it's very difficult for people to grab land or to, to have evictions because they already know that this certain area is for this family or this clan. So there is some sort of protection of the land from land grabbers. And then uh, in urban areas, promotion or promoting the violation of HLP rights through land grabbing and eviction, that is unlawful land distribution or allocation. Customary, like customary custodians of HLP rights, wielding a lot of power due to ambiguity of the law. Where you find that people, especially leaders who have a lot of power, they will be willing to you know, hand over land to people without following up with the community. But the good thing about the customs is that every land that is, is about to be allocated to someone else, the community has to be involved and uh, informed about it. Next slide, please. Margaret, um, just a few more minutes. So if you want to just um, yeah, move through the slides, that'd be great, thanks. Okay, okay, thank you, Jim. Um, so the impl implications for dual legal system, uh, the host communities mostly are inclined, they're less inclined to local integration. 
they do not want the people to, to, to stay in. They actually seek for most of the people who are not from that area to return to their places of origin or to relocate to different areas. Then also the host community is strict and unwilling to distribute land. They do not distribute to any person. So it becomes at least, uh, it's an implication in terms of this. Then also chiefs are sole distributors. So it results to a lot of land conflict and also local chiefs distribute land and both. Next slide. So the empowerment, uh, and when now we are going to unpack, uh, to unpack uh, the role of HLP actors. What are the HLP actors in South Sudan doing? So one, we have the empowerment of right holders of HLP. We have sensitization and awareness creation. We have capacity building for both actors, that is customary and formal. We do a lot of capacity building. We are also improving access to justice by providing legal assistance and community-based paralegals who help in the day-to-day -day, uh, HLP issues. We also provide technical assistance and guidance, that is land allocation and due diligence to the community. We also do a lot of advocacy where you find HLPOR and the HLP actors are the ones who are developing strat comprehensive stra uh, strategies like now we have the national land policy, it is still not out, but we as HLP actors are advocating for it because once it comes, we will be able to improve on a lot of HLP issues in South Sudan. Then we also give material support to the customary justice system so that it is easy for them to do uh, their work. Then uh, maybe next slide, please. So yeah, we just have... one more minute, Margaret, because um, just one more minute, just so we can have a couple of minutes for the questions. Thanks. Okay, so maybe we can, I can just go and breeze through the next next slide, please. Uh, since I have only one minute, the implications of for climate change. So for us in South Sudan, HLP issues are often exacerbated prior to or during the post disasters or flooding. Uh, South Sudan has a lot of floods and droughts and both these has, have led to displacement. You'll find people have seasonal displacement from their area of origin to another. So this climate change has been a major factor of HLP issues in South Sudan. Secondly, we have loss of documents. Once the floods come, the drought, majority of the documents are lost. So people have no documents to claim their land when they come back. Then it has also, uh, climate-related uh, issues may exacerbate natural resource conflicts. And this may ease or it may reduce the enjoyment of HLP rights. So it is therefore important uh, that HLP projects are designed with a climate um, focus to ensure adaptation and mitigation measure, measures do not contribute to HLP issues, but also promote HLP specific rights. Um, maybe just the next slide as I breeze through. Um, this is just a picture of one of the villages here in South Sudan where floods, once they come, they, they are very destructive and they can uproot people from their different places of origin. This has led to a lot of vulnerability and the cost of living has gone high. There's a lot of hostility and um, there's, uh, of course, the impending uh, durable solution. So this is just an illustration of what climate and protracted conflict on HLP results. I'm seeing um, the next slide, please, as I try to, this is also just another illustration of what happens in South Sudan due to the climate change issue. Uh, next slide. So key actions taken, key actions that us as HLPOR have taken. One is uh, capacity development of communities on climate change and environment. This includes uh, preventive actions such as flood mitigating strategies with the context of HLP. This is something that we are doing uh, to ensure that the, 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 the issue of climate change, floods and drought is, be, is able to be uh, handled. Then secondly is also awareness creation and information sessions aimed at encouraging communities to move to higher grounds during the rainy season and uh, also integrated approach and synergies. We are working hand in hand with our shelter cluster colleagues and the LFS 
this has been an investment and we have also encouraged the infrastructures such as dikes to be made to curb the issue of climate change in South Sudan. Jim, do I have more minutes? Can I continue? I think we'll have to leave it there, Margaret. Sorry, uh, because we've got just two minutes before we're supposed to finish. And I know okay. Julie and her team are very strict, so I will be in trouble otherwise. Um, um, and OK, and uh, but thank you so much for persisting with the tech and um, yeah, for all of you actually for, for joining on that. And just to say again, the, the resources will be shared um, you know, afterwards as well. So there's some really rich um, uh, presentations there and lots of information for people to, to digest as well. Um, Thank you. I think we have had, I want to just open just one question up because I think we've got like about 30 seconds before I turn to Eleonora to, to close. Um, some of the, one of the questions that was asked was about ensuring that women and children who are alone are included into HLP work. So I just wondered if any of our presenters wanted to make a comment on how they work with uh, women and children specifically around HLP issues uh, uh, and, and how, you, how you see that in, in your work. Um, would, would one of you like to make a, a, a brief comment on that? Um, Can I go ahead, Jim? Please do, yes, go Margaret, and then I'll turn to Ben briefly. Okay, thank you. Here in South Sudan, we tried, we have been champions of uh, women HLP rights in that most of our, the HLP actors have been supporting in terms of technical assistance to the South Sudan women agenda and ensuring that women are advised or are uh, aware of their rights in terms of uh, housing, land and property. And we also, make sure that we give the women a priority in terms of when we are going for legal assistance, when we're going for legal counseling, we try to ensure that women know their rights and they are given a priority in terms of re recovering or restitution of the different lands that they have lost and also to bring them into, in terms of knowing and also being ambassadors to the community, to their fellow women, about women HLP rights. Thanks, Margaret. And uh, just maybe if Ben, if you had a brief word and Evelyn, if you want to as well, and then we'll have to sadly uh, close the session. Um, but yeah, Ben, if you'd like to comment on that, please do. Oh, okay, yeah. Um, well, uh, just very briefly. Um, yeah, I think um, Afghanistan, of course, is um, you know facing numerous challenges uh, with regards to HLP rights and uh, women's HLP rights. and. In particular, so from the HLP AOR side, we're just trying to, you know, um, uh, raise the way. Yeah. Um, vulnerable uh, to things like evictions um, and how the humanitarian community uh, can best support them uh, to, uh, you know, in addition, uh, we've also been in the past years, uh, you know, uh, looking at uh, influencing regulatory reform. So the new land distribution, for example, land allocation to IDPs uh, includes the name of the man and the woman uh, household heads uh, rather than just just the male. Um, so briefly, that's just two things. Uh, but we have some, uh, you know, some uh, materials uh, that you can see online as well that we published on these on these uh, issues, so please do look at them. Thanks. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Um, Evelyn, just very briefly, and then I'm afraid we're going to have to close because our yeah, our time is up, sadly. If, yeah. if you, if anyone else, if Johanna would like to answer or others, you can please um, write in, a, in the chat. I believe you'll be able to share that with everyone. So please put a brief answer or share resources in there as well. Thanks. Evelyn, just very briefly, thank you. Yes, thank, thank you, Jim. Yeah, I would also love to just add on the voices, uh, particularly for Uganda. We've supported, first of all, the government to develop agenda and land strategy. Here we've shown the government how to incorporate the, the, the rights, the HLP rights of women in land, uh, land management, and uh, it has been adopted by the government and uh, the different actors use it. But specifically for our projects, we use the gender evaluation criteria, which is a tool built by the Global Land Tool Network on uh, how to involve more people into being gender sensitive and gender responsive in, uh, in the 
in the project. For example, just one example, initially when we were starting, we ruled out that we, we issued the applications, but only men had applied for the certificates of customary ownership. But we recalled them, did a sensitization, showed them the importance of having women and children included on these certificates. And you would be surprised by the numbers that came out. It was really overwhelming. Men understood it. And they, they are, for example, in Butaleja, we have over 80% is joint ownership on the titles. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Evelyn. I'm afraid we're going to have to draw it to a close. I'm really pleased to pass to uh, my colleague from UN Habitat, Eleonora uh, Sopi, who's going to do our, our, our closing. And uh, yeah, just thanks from me. Over to you, Eleonora. Thank you, Jim. Well, um, as we reach the conclusion of our virtual session, um, I want to express our appreciation to all our presenters for their work and for today's insightful presentation, as well as our production team and all the presenters who made this session possible. Um, and of course, to our uh, great moderator, Jim. Uh, I would like to take this opportunity to reiterate the HLPAR commitment to address HLP issues and the centrality of house land and property rights to achieve durable solutions for displacement, uh, displaced uh, affected communities and related protection objectives. Um, I would also like to draw your attention to the multi-stakeholder HLP pledge that has been developed in partnership by UNHCR, UN Habitat, and NRC in the occasion of the Global Refugee, Refugee Forum. Um, you will find some additional information about it in the chat. Please um, review it. This is a uh, um, practical opportunity for all of us to uh, contribute to the HLP work and to um, address HLP challenges. If you would like to learn more on how to engage with the HLPOR, uh, please visit our website or reach out directly to our core coordinator, Jim and Ombretta. Again, all information in the chat. I wish you all a good day, afternoon and evening, depending on who you are. And um, thank you again for participating. Bye-bye.